you mean, you mean Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Artists Now, which many of you are in the course that's in conjunction with the class, so welcome all the students. But welcome everyone else from the general public who's attending uh, the Artists Now lecture series. Please attend all the lectures. They are always interesting, always fascinating. You never know what you will see or what uh, artists might inspire or speak to your concerns. Um, I want to hype up next week's lecture so that you folks are here and you spread the word. Um, next week's guest is Nathaniel Stern's guest, so I'm assuming uh, art and technology will be well represented. Uh, you might also notice that we, all these artists, many of the artists that we see and do see in the series cross disciplines, where they work across disciplines, work in galleries, museums, communities, you name it, work with all different types of mediums. Uh, next weekend is Cynthia uh, Heromilo is presenting. And just from looking at her work and seeing what she's about, uh, she does a lot of video work, a lot of public art, a lot of light boxes, and so forth. And so uh, that will be next week, so spread the news. Uh, tell friends, family, and other students to attend these lectures. Tonight, we are lucky to have Seju Jones from Minneapolis present. Um, Raul will, will introduce uh, Setu in a second. I remember hearing Setu present up in Minneapolis, and he's talking about a, many subjects, urban farming, water issues that relate so much to Milwaukee, right? And I told Setu that uh, our audience is very interesting and very diverse as far as majors, mediums, and concerns. We're not just our students. There's students from every major on campus here. Uh, so I said, open the floodgates, tell us everything you do, you know, so forth. And, uh, uh, and here we go. Raul Deal will present tonight's guest. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. I also reiterate what Nicholas said. This is a wonderful series, and I, I thank the students, the art and design students, who actually are co-sponsors of every artist now lecture through differential tuition. And just a reminder, take that survey until the end of the week you have online survey to decide how your mind is spent. Um, I also want to thank the Cultures and Communities Program, Dr. Greg Day, who also is supporting the event tonight. Uh, I had a, an opportunity today to just to spend an extraordinary morning with Seitu and his wife, uh, Soini, who also is here. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I found myself uh, feeling like was a, a, a fly on the wall listening to friends speak about their personal histories. And we were at the Walnut Way Conservation Corps. They were sharing stories with Sharon Adams and, and Larry Adams uh, and with Matoke Johnson. And so I was learning about uh, the African American community in different cities around uh, the country and, and uh, the effect that urban renewal had on that. And one of the things that Seifu kept talking about uh, was his formation as a youngster uh, growing out of the, the 1960s and the turbulent uh, time for art and music and politics. And as a result of that, he said that he was able to sort of form as a citizen and, and as an artist. Uh, a, a, key, a key element that he learned from that experience is one should leave their community more beautiful than they found it. And that, I think, is kind of a guiding principle in much of what I know about Seitu. Uh, he creates large-scale public artworks and scenic designs for theaters. Uh, his art's been exhibited widely. It's been at the Walker Center, uh, in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the American Craft Museum in New York, uh, the Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and the list goes on. He has some other credentials that I'd like to share. Here are some of them. Uh, he's the former community programs coordinator at the Walker's, uh, art Center, Walker Art Center. Uh, he has been awarded the Minnesota Arts Board Fellowship, a McKnight, McKnight Visual Art Fellowship, a Bush Artist Fellowship, National Endowment for the Arts for Theater and Communication uh, Group Designer Fellowship. So he's very uh, broad and widely experienced and uh, certainly has lots of accolades. Um, he was also awarded a Lowe Fellowship in the Harvard Graduate School of Design. The first artist in residence, I'm sorry, not the first, uh, an artist in residence in Harvard Ceramic Program. Um, 
He was the city of Minneapolis's first artist in residence, and he's also on faculty at Goddard uh, College uh, in Seattle, Washington. So uh, he has lots of uh, things to share with us. In addition to being a public artist, which of course he's known for. He's also a neighborhood organizer, he's a gardener, he's very, and he'll be talking a little bit about all of that today. Uh, and along with his, with his wife and neighbors, uh, he's been working to build up his uh, neighborhood in, in St. Paul, which is called Frogtown, and I think he'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, recently, uh, he was awarded along with Public Art St. Paul a Joyce Foundation Fellowship, which I also know you'll hear a little bit about, but I investigated that a little bit, and the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the principles of the, uh, of the, the uh, PSAP is that they wish to create a city where imagination is evident, history is honored, and our collective daily living is the great masterpiece of our time. And I think that describes very well uh, what he's up to. So uh, I'll leave it at that and I'll I ask you to join me in welcoming Zaytu Jones. Woo, thanks, Raul. That uh, kind of blows me away listening to you. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to come to share my work with you. And uh, I want to say really what a blessing this is, uh, to be able to stand in front of a group of folks who are, in a way, captive. So I can kind of share, uh, share a wide range of things. And, and I'm going to go all around here uh, with my work. So I'm going to start in one place and go back to that place and then come to another place and zip around. But first, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to, this is actually another blessing, another blessing was to be able to come here and to hang out with folks, to hang out with uh, Larry and Sharon Adams and Walnut Way. For those of you all who are not familiar with the transformative work that they're having here in Milwaukee, you need to check it out. You need to make sure that you hook up with Raul and actually even see his work, see the way that art can be integrated into, uh, into that transformation. Um, and, and then to hang out with uh, a group of graduate students here, I need to give a shout out to those folks who are really inspiring. Um, Mutabe, whose name was just mentioned, Brooklyn, uh, Chantala, uh, uh, Diana, and, and, and Tyson. I mean, there's a group of folks who work I was able to check out and was, was moved by that. And so you all are fortunate to have a group of folks here in your midst, including Raul, uh, who are all very inspiring and who all are, whose, whose task it is, like the task that I'm asking you all to take on, is to change the world. And that's where I'm going to end up, hopefully, with going through this process. So uh, thank you. And, and it's always hard for an artist to begin to talk uh, and not to be accompanied by pictures, especially for visual artists. So I'm going to have to share that work with you as well. And, and also, you know, it's great to know that there are all of these folks here from different disciplines. Uh, I should, I'm going to out myself right now and let you all know that while I've been making art for over 35 years, I don't have a degree in art. I've got a degree, uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in landscape design and uh, a graduate degree in environmental history. And I use all of those as tools in my work. I work in a variety of mediums that you'll see, a variety of forms and in a variety of settings. I create work that is specific to the site. And whether, that is, whether those manifest themselves as objects or uh, as an event or some piece of ephemera, uh, some piece that's really temporary, they uh, all are here to really help transform that space and respond to the social, characteristics of the site, 
the cultural history of the site, and the physical char characteristics of the site in different ways. And also, I should tell you, too, that I'd like to, even with this big group here, I'd like to keep this as a, a, as a dialogue in a way. So I'm not going to sit here and drone on and on and on. And I could do that, definitely. And, and I, could, I guarantee I could put everybody here to sleep. But I'm not going to do that tonight, I promise. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it uh, quick enough so that we have enough time near the end of this so that we're able to engage in a real dialogue. Make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, and I should even explain this. I mean, I really wasn't quite sure what to call this talk. Uh, I blend art and agriculture, or art and nature, in a wide range of ways. And so this is a good catch-all right now. I, I, just spent, um, I just spent a year and a half uh, working with the Minnesota Institute of Sustainable Agriculture at the University of Minnesota as a senior fellow in agricultural systems, focusing on research and developing a new uh, undergraduate major uh, in sustainable food systems at, at, at the university. And also, I should say that I shared this joint appointment with Will Allen. Uh, so whenever we could catch Will Allen in town, we were able to, to work together. And for those of you guys, everybody knows who Will Allen is here in this room? How many people know who Will Allen is? Well, for those of you all who don't know, Will Allen is the premier urban farmer uh, in the U.S. and has developed a whole set of systems on growing food and growing food in small spaces and growing food in urban places. Uh, in particular, but also his work uh, that underlies all of this. Will says he has three goals. One is to grow farmers, to train more folks to become farmers. Another is to grow soy. Uh, and that's a comment on the condition of the soil, fertil so soil fertility, not just in rural areas, but also in urban areas and the conditions of our soils. And then, the final thing he wants to do is to grow community. And you really should have Will here at some point to, to talk to a group like this. Um, but I'm going to start out by talking about a number of objects that I've made, and made in collaboration, which is a, 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 one of the tenets of my work. Uh, and so what you see here is a, a group of one in a group of shadows. Uh, that are set in the pavement here in, um, in the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. And these sh shadows are really, are just that, are shadows. And they're designed so that at some point, and they're lined up on different uh, astronomical phenomena. Uh, so this piece here, I think, is lined up with the summer solstice and at different times. Uh, so the, uh, the two equinoxes the, and the two solstices. So they are, and so these seven shadows are lined up so that you can walk in the shadows of these people who came before. This is a collaboration with another artist who uh, we were just talking about earlier today, Takumba Aiken, who has been a uh, partner and collaborator for, for many years, and, uh, and my wife, who is a poet, uh, who is here in the audience, who I also need to give a shout out to, uh, who wrote these poems that are, uh, that are set into these shadows. And so what's kept these things polished are the movement of feet over them for years and years. Uh, that's kept the, the text polished. And, and each one of these poems relates to the movement of different peoples to Minneapolis and the development of Minneapolis. And this one is dedicated to a Dakota woman who, uh, who in folklore, gave her life uh, 
or, or lost her life when her canoe went over the uh, St. Anthony Falls. Uh, and this was, this is the only set of falls on the entire length of the Mississippi River. Portrait of Harriet Tubman in Corten Steel, standing about nine feet tall. And here she's pointing north. This is uh, a part of, or really on the grounds of, the Harriet Tubman Women's Alliance, a woman, what started out as a woman's shelter, and then became this uh, larger support group. But just working with negative space there. This is one of the few interior pieces that I've included here in this. And this is, uh, this relates to a passion of mine, too. This, uh, I love boats and kind of grew up in boats. Every weekend for a long time, we were, uh, you know, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes. And my father and uncle fished in almost every single one of them. And had taken uh, me and a uh, couple of cousins out in those boats every weekend. And so I make wooden boats and help start an organization that helps build community and build youth uh, called Urban Boat Builders. Uh, and, and so I've used a lot of those techniques in sculpture. And so here we use this process of, uh, of using steam, infusing wood uh, with steam and then shaping it around the form to create this piece that we call sedimentary. <coughs> this is on the inside of a library, the addition to a library. And the, uh, the great thing for me is this was the library that my mother used to drag my sister and I to. My sister is now a school principal in the same neighborhood. But this was a library that she used to drag us to so we could borrow books. And we learned how to read. <laughs> from books from this library, from Sumner Library. And here, uh, sedimentary really is about this neighborhood that surrounds this library. You know, libraries now, and libraries in the past, over the last hundred years, have been the entry point for some of America's newest immigrants. And this neighborhood in Minneapolis has always absorbed the most recent immigrants, wherever they're from. And we live in a neighborhood like that in St. Paul, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, but this was the neighborhood where my earliest memories are from, are from Sumner Library. So this is a great way for me to give back by creating this piece here. And here I worked with, um, uh, worked with a, a, a poet uh, and a printmaker, bookmaker, uh, named uh, George Roberts. And George and I collaborated over the years on something that kind of culminated with this particular piece here. And here, what we wanted to do was to show how these different cultures uh, were added to and kind of uh, the, the a culture would build on the the progress of the culture before in different ways. And so, and it also kind of resembled a cliff, so you could actually see the sedimentary features in the, the cliff. Uh, and, and we use different woods, and woods from around the world, as well as most of the wood coming from the old library shelves that we were uh, uh, gassing in a dumpster. <laughs> we hauled those things out and then uh, cut them in the strips over about a three-day period, working with a group of students from North Community High School in, uh, in Minneapolis to create this piece. Show you a set of pieces about water that I've done. I've been able to uh, work, in wa work with water and water features, creating these pieces of infrastructure uh, that are best management practices in stormwater management. Uh, and, and I should also point out, I had to look at the clock here. Right now as we speak, the meeting that I'm missing in St. Paul is the meeting uh, with my watershed district. I'm on the board of managers for my watershed district. Been doing that for the last nine years as another way of giving back. 
And this particular piece here is just a grate, an overflow grate in a stormwater pond. I'm not going to show you the pond here. I was the artist on a design team working with a group of landscape architects and engineers and designing these water, uh, designing these stormwater management features. And so the grate here uh, is really just flat steel but that I wanted to uh, have this sense of movement or to demonstrate this sense of movement in. And using this turtle as a way uh, that, as a way to show the return of nature to this little neighborhood. And I should even say too, and I'll go, actually I'm gonna go ahead here and talk a little bit about my particular link with this neighborhood. But the text that's in here is to remind everyone that whatever you put in this stormwater pond will end up in the Mississippi. This is just a, a mile and a half away from the Mississippi River. Uh, here you see the turtle again here at a little bit larger scale on this, uh, on this railing that really separates us from this, uh, separates us from the stormwater pond. And this is actually above that grate that we saw. I should have even pointed out to and I forgot that the symbols around that arch there are from a mum quilt. And it's a symbol for a snail. And so you see, I use a lot of different sources with my work and, and, and layering this work to give it some meaning and to really have it relate to this place. And also here, under each panel, is the word for nature and the languages of all the people who lived here, from the Dakota all the way up to the most recent immigrants who were from Somalia. And here is another overlook. And what you see here on this railing is our facades, facades of the old uh, Sumner Field homes that were the what we call the old projects and this is where my earliest memories come from from the set of uh, uh, from the set of low-rise buildings that were designed in 19 designed and constructed in 1932 making it the second oldest federally funded housing project in the US and by the time my family moved in in the 50s this place had really been used. In addition, uh, it had been built on uh, this former wetland. So by the time, uh, and, and so after just a couple of years in the 30s, you know, some of these units, after these folks ignored the soils uh, and the condition of the soils, and not recognizing that this was a former wetland, had just placed these things on these flat foundations without really doing any work to stabilize these buildings. So they had started to crack. Uh, and, and so by the time my family moved in, you know, there were these wide cracks in, uh, in the walls. And that led to a whole slew of these former wetland animals and creatures that we'd find in, in our place. My mother always talked about the, the huge water bugs that she would find. Uh, in our place. I mean, I found it fascinating at the time, not realizing that that folks shouldn't live like that, or don't have to live like that, or shouldn't here uh, in, in, in a federally funded housing project. And what you see here is, you see fair housing here, and you see these panels that are below that, and those are granite panels with a timeline of the fair housing history in, uh, in Minneapolis. So there are a lot of layers here. And I did this railing to remind folks that of what came before, so that you have to look through these, through these old facades to see the new facades that came after. And it's a long story to tell you about the demolition of these things, the suit uh, that uh, was placed against HUD and the uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, and, and that's another whole story, but 
Uh, my earliest memories are from this place. The Sumner Library is just a block away from this particular site. And so I use a lot of text in my work. You know, just like this piece here. Uh, this is a, a wall with all these words uh, for house. That, and the languages of all the people settled on the west side of St. Paul. And this wall stretches for about 300 feet. And, and about two blocks away from the Mississippi River in St. Paul. And that's part of the reason I chose to design this undulating curve here uh, in, the, in, the, in the wall and in the railing. You know, another piece that's a stormwater feature that works, that uses text. And you can see the text that's etched into uh, the tops of these stones. This is a, a stormwater retention pond in a new school in South Minneapolis, a private school. But what I did here was to, you, to mine the mission of the school to place all of these words on top of this. And so uh, when a student, uh, when there's a, a little dry period or after this, this stormwater drains from this pond, you know, students are able to go and actually sit on these things. This is a sketch for a drinking fountain that I just completed in, uh, in Minneapolis. It's on Main Street. Once again, across the street from the Mississippi River. And here, I wanted this piece to... Uh, uh, the, the bowl there actually is to, actually, I'm going to ask folks, what does this look like? A heart. A heart. What else? A whale tail. tail. A whale tail, yeah. What else? Open hand. Open hand, yeah. Well, you know what it actually is? It's the shell of an endangered muscle. And it's really a, a, an interpretation of that. I mean, it doesn't look exactly like the shell of the muscle, but it's, uh, it, it recalls that. And what I wanted to do was to make this thing, and so when you drink out of this fountain, you have to bend down and hold the bowl. And so when a person is actually using this thing, and this is, like I said, right on the river, so there are a lot of runners and walkers and cyclists that come by and stop here at the fountain. So when you're using this thing, I want it to, to seem as if you were holding this bowl with water pouring out of the stainless steel surface. In addition, what you can see here is because it's uh, really a dark shadow, is there's a pet bubbler uh, at the base of this thing. So people can even water their pets, <laughs> their dogs, as they go through it. This is my backyard from about 10 years ago. And uh, what we have done here is every year we take out more and more turf. And so what we have left is about what this circle is, and maybe even smaller than that right now. And uh, I started cutting these patterns in my own yard just as a way of sculpting the turf. Uh, it's what I'd like to say, but really what it ended up being was a way that I could just mow half of my lawn. <laughs> and also integrating these sculptures uh, into, the, into the, our garden and yard. And these pieces still out, are out there, these sentinels. Uh, these are, I should say, a ceramic. And here is another one of my passions. Uh, what you see here, anybody recognize what this plant is here in the foreground? This is our garden. This is our garden from a while back here. But anybody recognize those plants? Collards. Collards, yeah. These are collard greens here, part of the Brassica family. And I have been intrigued with collards over a, a period, over maybe about 15 and 20 year period. It's a way of accessing African American culture. So it's this rich metaphor and all these things that come up that have to do with folklore 
and cuisine, uh, ethnobotany. I mean, it's layered with so many different things. And so it led me on this search, so the search for the collins. And where I ended up was like right here initially. <laughs> this is a, a, a Roman soldier. The collard is from the Mediterranean region. And it was said that the Roman army was fueled by collards. And so the, they took over the world uh, and created this empire on collard greens, or on this kind of collard green diet. But I mean, it's interesting here to compare and contrast this Roman soldier standing and the stance of this woman here, not holding a spear in her hand, but holding a hoe uh, in her ancient garden, holding collards once again, harvesting collards. This is a collard field in Georgia, the farmer that created these collards. These collards are actually going into the Atlanta Public Schools, too, this particular batch here. And uh, one of my interpretations of it, and this is or one of my spins on it. This was a collard green shrine. And here I uh, created this piece inside of a small shotgun house in Houston, Texas. So I covered the walls in canvas and found an old uh, sofa and uh, some wood to create a couple benches and painted those with collard greens. It was a way to kind of honor and celebrate this. And also, it was a way for me to collect recipes. And so I asked people, uh, when they came into this small house, to give me their recipes. And so I got all kind of wild recipes. And maybe I should collect some from some of you all as well, too. Being you all were able to recognize those collars really quickly. Uh, I know that there are probably some good collard recipes in here. Now, I got all kind of wild recipes. I got one recipe that said, uh, uh, this brother wrote, like, his best collard green recipe was find a good woman, marry her, and you have collard greens for the rest of your life. Uh, another one was this family tradition of using the jaw of a pig to season their collard greens, but only after it sat on top of the refrigerator for about a week. Uh, and so it was a wide range of things uh, that, that I collected. And I don't think that you all have any recipes like that. Uh, but uh, and it was also a way to involve the community because what we did is we planted a, 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 a small collard green patch in front of this house and behind this house. And I should point out too, this is Project Rural Houses. Uh, that was created by a group of African-American artists in Houston. And Project Row Houses is now a thriving art center, but it began as a way that artists uh, stepped in to stop the demolition of a block of shotgun houses. And for you guys that don't know, a shotgun house, how many people have seen a shotgun house before? And shotgun houses are these small houses. And really, this is an African, American uh, traditional design. Uh, this was a design that came through uh, the southern part of the U.S. from New Orleans by way of Haiti. Brought to, this design was brought to the U.S. by Haitian immigrants uh, in the, at the early part of the 19th century. Uh, anyway, this group of artists stopped the demolition of these small houses. And these are small houses. When I say small, they're generally like between 9 and 20 feet wide. These, I think, are about uh, 15 feet wide. So really narrow and long. And they're called shotgun houses because supposedly you could stand in one end uh, in the front door and have a shotgun fire it through the house, and none of the, uh, there wouldn't be any spread. It would go straight through the house without hitting any walls, because uh, they're so narrow and, and so small. Anyway, this group of artists stopped the demolition of these houses, because they were looking for a place to display their work. And what came of that was not only a place for them to display their work, 
but a place also where these artists uh, have now, uh, where this art center now has gotten to the point where they invite artists to Houston to work a project in the third ward of Houston uh, to work on Project Row House, uh, to work at Project Row Houses twice a year um, to create these fantastic installations inside the house and outside the house. So the gardens that we planted in front and behind the house ended up going to feed some of the young folks that come into uh, their after school programs. Uh, another collard green shrine, this one is in the other side of the country in, in Maine, or this one was in the other side of the country in Maine, and these were these temporary pieces. Uh, this piece was done with just by recycling cardboard and using old paint, old house paint, to create this sculpture that was at its highest point, uh, about 12 feet high. And there again, in the traffic circle outside the museum, we planted a, a field of collards that ended up going into the food service for Bates College. You know, and I've created a number of smaller objects, once again playing with collards. You know, so this box that opens up to reveal the instrument, the primary instrument that you would use in planting collards, as well as a seed package that I designed. You know, so these are seed bombs. Anybody ever seen or made seed bombs? Yeah, so this is, these are bombs of peace. These are these implements that you can use to help transform your neighborhood. And so really what they are is a mix of compost, dry clay, and seeds that you can compress together. And what I did here was use uh, the pattern of a World War II era grenade, uh, something that you could lob into a vacant lot or a, a bare spot on the boulevard, or a bare spot in your neighbor's backyard uh, that would contain seeds that are vegetable seeds, that are grass seeds, wildflower seeds. And I use the same mold to make up these snowballs. Now, I had done, I had created this and these things about the same time, around 2008, uh, when uh, Barack Obama was first running. Uh, and at the time, the Republicans had their national convention in St. Paul. And so what I did is I, had, I did a pile of snowballs uh, and placed them in my freezer preparing for when the Republicans came. Uh, and there was all of these mass protests that were planned. And I was planning on lobbing these snowballs. But what happened is the, there is this kind of chemical change or in, the, in the freezer. And so these snowballs uh, ended up as like solid ice. And so, if I would have thrown these things, I, I wouldn't be here now. I mean, you still, you'd have to start the Free Say 2 movement to, to get me out of jail. But we took that idea of using these, uh, uh, creating these bombs of peace to Haiti. And so this is in Port-au-Prince. And what I did was work with uh, uh, a youth center there and work with about 20 kids and we made about 200 of these small seed bombs so that we could help green uh, Port-au-Prince Haiti. And so this is me lobbing some of those balls in Haiti here. These bombs of peace. And even showing what uh, what could happen there. Now, you know, just recently I designed this thing that was a composter. Uh, 
Uh, and I originally thought about it like a lawnmower. This is a globe here so that you could put food waste and yard waste into and stir it so that uh, you get that action from time to time that you're supposed to do with compost to create soil, to build soil. And here I work with a group of high school students in St. Paul uh, that helped me uh, fabricate this thing from uh, fur and from marine uh, plywood to create this thing here. So it changed a little bit and actually got bigger. This thing is a four foot diameter and it has a door in it. This is a globe here. Uh, we use just um, uh, carpet underlay that's recycled to create the continents on it. And with this screen here, designed to, to give the compost air, but you, it has a door in it so that you can put uh, the yard waste and food waste into, let it compost, and then to stir it so the entire glow moves. You can see the, the handle there for it. And this is just part of this effort that we've launched in our neighborhood to help green line this neighborhood. Although this is an ad that, uh, in our neighborhood this photo is actually from the Minnesota Landscape Art Museum, where they commission a group of artists every year to create pieces that are around a particular theme. That are, uh, I did a piece there a few years back on water, where we built a pontoon. And it was a piece that was actually entitled Watershed. So you could walk out onto the pontoon and contemplate the watershed that was right in front of you, along with these maps that like placed you in the watershed. But this piece now is back at the high school uh, where, I, uh, where I drew students from to help me create this. And so, and this, um, this high school isn't too far away from our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is called Frogtown. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in St. Paul. And it's a long and narrow, uh, a neighborhood that is defined by the state capitol on one end and defined by a parkway on another end. It's one of the poorest neighborhoods in St. Paul, but it's also the more, most diverse neighborhood in all of St. Paul. So it has all this energy and vitality in it. It has been a neighborhood that's really been defined by its pathologies, by all the things that are wrong with it. Uh, and one of the things that happened to, to uh, to lead to that, and to lead to those pathologies, is the denial of services and the denial of resources. And that led to its underdevelopment. And that was sometimes very conscious. You know, there was this, anybody know what redlining is? Yes. How many folks know redlining? You know, for those of you all who don't, redlining is as practiced by uh, banks and insurance companies, where they would look at a map, and generally that map had poor whites or people of color uh, that were in this, that were on this geographic area. They would draw a red line around that area and consciously deny services to that neighborhood. Uh, and so our neighborhood is one that was defined by red line. And we want to transform that to greening our neighborhood and green lining our neighborhood. And so we have launched, and I say we, and I'm going to use that now a lot throughout the rest of this talk, uh, which is only going to go for a few more minutes, but um, the, when I say we, I'm talking about neighbors. I'm talking first of all about myself and my wife, uh, and that extends to neighbors, that extends to institutions, organizations. Uh, and a group of like-minded folks that are working to green our neighborhood. Another, uh, another check against us is that we have, in Frogtown, the least amount of tree canopy uh, than any other neighborhood in St. Paul. And so we're changing that and transforming that in a wide range of ways, from working with folks uh, doing small boxes. This is uh, uh, from a program that we've worked with, that my wife in particular has worked with, called Garden in the Box, 
from the state historic, uh, from the state horticulture society, where a resident is given these four boards, uh, bags of soil, and some starter plants as a way just to get folks' toe in the water, uh, to use another metaphor, to garden, to break down and place us once again uh, close to the land. You know, we have also set this goal. And one of the tenets that of the, you know, when Raul was introducing me, it mentioned the, the 60s and the, the, the ferment and get me getting caught up in the rich mix of politics and music and, and it, it, to the point where one of the tenets from that time, and I got this from uh, the cultural nationalist movement, is that you should leave your community more beautiful than you found. Um, you know, the, and another tenet of that time was to really, you know, help to transform your community in different ways. You know, so we moved from that to working with folks and, and really just advocating these initiatives. Uh, these are larger boxes outside of a community school. To uh, a couple of full-scale farms that we have also advocated for. And I really describe myself not as a farmer, but an urban agricultural uh, advocate. Uh, this is a farm that's just a couple blocks away from us. This is a, a field of potatoes uh, that were planted by uh, a CSA farm, a community supported agricultural farm, where folks have taken out shares in this farmer's yield and will get a bag of groceries throughout the summer, throughout the growing season, that included potatoes from Frogtown. You know, a group of farmers. You know, a lot of times I like to contrast this image here with the image that I have of three farmers in West Africa and asking folks to talk about the differences, but really it's to, to talk about the commonalities. You know, farmers all over the world are faced with many of the same challenges. Control of the land, control of access to water, access to market, storage, transportation. Those are basic fundamental issues that, are, that relate to farmers, and that should impact us all when we think about our roles in the food system, we're all a part of this vast, invisible food system. And, and we really don't see it. Uh, we are, you know, I taught a class last, uh, last spring, and <coughs> one of the students in the class, we were talking about the food system, he said, man, we're all bottom feeders. And we pretty much are. I mean, our access to the food system is going, is consuming. Not in production, not in transportation. Uh, one of the things that Will Allen talks about is are all these economic opportunities that exist in the food system. He said one time he sat down and he listed out all the many jobs and came up to over a hundred jobs that included marketing, that included uh, uh, even just washing, processing, I mean all these many different things that we should get and uh, one of the things that I just recently uh, got a hold of is, is, is farm packing. Uh, there are a group of folks in, uh, in the Twin Cities right now that are getting together and talking about the uh, the ways and plotting and planning ways to take off-the-shelf parts, including uh, bicycle parts, to create these kind of local solutions to these global problems. And one is like to create a tractor from parts off the shelf, uh, to create uh, watering devices, uh, but to use these common solutions. You know, as a part of as a part of uh, working to green our neighborhood, we've also been working with trees. This is a workshop here 
that we held a few years back on grafting. Uh, and we grafted these fruit trees that were then placed at a community center, allowed to grow over a year's time, to the point where at a community event we distributed these fruit trees to neighbors. I've kept track of these fruit trees, where they are in people's yards, so that we can go back and monitor them. And maybe at some point in time, literally buy the fruit from these trees so that they can become a part of our, lo of our local food system. We sponsored a number of Arbor Day events uh, in Frogtown. This is an Arbor Day event here uh, from just last year, where we planted a temporary pop-up park that contained five fruit trees, but 20, uh, five fruit trees and 20, uh, and 20 fruit trees and five shade trees. That's what I was trying to say. And at the end of the summer, these trees were distributed to residents in Frogtown. These are uh, plums from our backyard. We planted a fruit tree uh, when we first moved in. And you know, Raul ran off a whole list of accomplishments there, but one of the proudest things uh, that I've accomplished is winning blue ribbons for my plums that are grown in my backyard in Frogtown. I'm working right now on a big event called Spoken Remedy, the Community Meal. The reason it's called Spoken Remedy is because I'm collaborating with a group of artists, including a couple of spoken word artists. That, and this is going to be an intervention into the food system in a way that we can educate people in the food system. And so you're going to have to keep abreast of this. And you all are all invited to this event. This will be uh, a meal on one of the main streets in, that connects Minneapolis to St. Paul, University Avenue. And it's going to be a, at a table that will be between a half a mile and three quarters of a mile long. Uh, much of the artwork will be in the food system. Part of the legacy, and what we've done here is create a whole series of prototypes for mobile kitchens. We're calling these attack kitchens, in a way. Uh, and so part of the legacy will be leaving behind uh, this set of maybe up to 30, these cook kits that can be rolled out to uh, uh, a parking lot in a grocery store, supermarket, uh, a park. Uh, families will be able to check these out, as well as chefs being able to check these things out. And so this is the first prototype here that we've, de that we've designed. And we're coming up with a, a many other ones, some that can be towed by a bike, uh, that are going to be that small. But part of that meal will be cooked on these small kitchens. And what led me to all of this was being a part of a group that, uh, that received a small grant from the USDA to uh, do a food assessment of my neighborhood, Frogtown, and the neighborhood directly across University Avenue called Summit University Avenue, asking people, what are the obstacles that prevent you from making healthy food choices. And we, of course, knew the first thing that came up would be what? What do you think? What was the first obstacle to making healthy food choices? Money. Money, yeah, cost. We knew that was going to come up. Or at least a perception of cost. Because the cost of cheap calories uh, is really expensive when you look at uh, what it does to our health, what it does to the environment as opposed to the cost of quality calories. But that's another discussion. The, one of the things that came up right after that that surprised me was people don't make healthy food choices because they have forgotten how to prepare the food or are intimidated by preparing the food. We have lived for so long now, for the last 60 years of this industrialized food system that, and living out of boxes and living, buying cheap calories, 
we have forgotten how to prepare those quality calories. And so this whole event is designed to help transform that. And that's why these mobile kitchens are important. And so what we've done here is begin to map the food system. We have begun to do that uh, not just using these literal maps, but the tablecloth on our big community meal will uh, help diagram and place you in the food system. We all have a role in the food system. Let's hope it's not all bottom feeders. And this is where I'm going to end. I've just got a few more slides here. And this is why did I do this? Or why am I doing this? And this is where it gets personal. This is my great grandfather who uh, was born a slave in the 1840s, uh, moved to Minnesota in the 1870s, 1879. Uh, and met my great-grandmother. He was, he was elderly then, what we would call elderly uh, at that time. He was in his 60s when he met my great-grandmother, who was in her 20s. Uh, they bore, uh, and I should say, this is what I really wanted to go with this, is that he uh, was a porter for many years in a hotel that still exists uh, in Red Wing, Minnesota. He moved from Red Wing to Rochester, Minnesota, where he farmed. He was a farmer. Most of us in here are just one or two and three generations removed from our farming roots. You know, so we're all close to that. And so why am I doing this? I'm doing this not just because of my great-grandfather, my grandmother, uh, who is here on the uh, on on my right, on your left, and my grandfather, who was a sleeping car porter. Uh, this is my mother and father when they were married, and then this is me in my grandmother's backyard. Uh, so I have been, and and this is just. Now, this is how stuff happens full circle. This is uh, less than a mile away from where we live. Uh, and, and this house is still in our family. Uh, the yard is entirely different. Her plum trees are gone. Because uh, I remember her plum trees. And most of her garden is gone. And, and this uh, post here from the clothesline is, is also gone from a time before dryers, when everybody put their uh, clothes out on the out on the line, and some people are moving back to that again here. Now, I also come to this because my father was an artist. This is a portrait that he had started of me that he never finished. And my father was my biggest booster. Now, I grew up in this family, this uh, this rich, big, loving family that told all of the folks in my generation over and over and over again how smart we were. My father had uh, seven brothers and sisters, so there were eight of them. Uh, and most of those folks had kids. And so we all grew up like a family. Like my cousins, my first cousins were like brothers and sisters to me. And they expected us to excel. They expected us to go past what their generation did. You know, we were just a couple generations from slavery. Now, my aunties over and over and over again told me how smart I was and told all of us that to the point where we actually began to believe it. And where we were told about the obstacles, and we knew about the obstacles that were going to be out there for us as uh, in whatever field of endeavor we wanted to go into. But we were expected to excel and expected to achieve. It's part of also the reason I do this work. Anybody recognize who this is now? This is not a member of my family, at least directly now. Anybody know who this is? 
This is George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver, the great agriculturalist uh, who experimented with peanuts, experimented with sweet potatoes. And the reason he did that, I mean, we've heard those stories about George Washington Carver. Uh, and I mean, a lot of his work uh, was based in and around Tuskegee Institute, this grand uh, African-American college uh, in Alabama that was founded by uh, an ex-slave. And George Washington Carver, in fact, was born as a slave. Uh, eventually got his uh, PhD uh, in Iowa. Uh, I want to say the University of Iowa. And uh, he was this scientist whose greatest legacy, really, wasn't so much the work he did with peanuts, uh, developing all these different functions with peanuts and with sweet potatoes, but also, but was working, developing an extension service from Tuskegee Institute. So he took his ideas, he took his techniques to a wide range of poor farmers uh, around Tuskegee, uh, there in Alabama, both white and black. But what people don't know, and what really led him into his study of botany, was painting. You know, George Washington Carver was an artist. And the reason I use this is because I had an auntie that used to call me little George Washington Carver. And I used to bristle at that. I knew who George Washington Carver was, and I only had these images of him as an old man. I mean, he had died long before I was born. Uh, I shouldn't say long before I was born, not too far. I was born in the middle of the last century, and he died uh, in the early 40s, I want to say. But he was a painter. It was only as an adult that I really knew his history and knew his history as a painter. And it was an art teacher, uh, like many of you all here, who recognized his talent and, and encouraged him to cross a discipline. Uh, this art teacher, uh, he noticed that he was always painting plants and had told him that he should probably study botany. And the rest is history after that. But he never stopped painting. In fact, using local materials, what was around him, using the soils, using uh, plants, he used to, as pigments, uh, used local cotton, even in uh, the, the canvas that he used. Here's a painting. And here's one of the few surviving paintings uh, by George Washington Carver. But that's still just part of the reason. And this is where I'm going to close here. I mean, in forums like this, and this is one of the things we talked about even today when we were at Walnut Way. In forums like this, we don't spend enough time talking about love. And I'm not talking about uh, the kind of love that we generally celebrate on Valentine's Day just a little while ago. But I'm talking about the love that we have for each other. I'm talking about the love that you have for your family, the love that you have for your community, but really, most importantly, the love that you have for humankind. Now, I know that all of you all are not here to make a million dollars. Maybe you are. I don't know. I, you know, maybe we all are be on that path to become millionaires. Uh, but you are here because uh, you love what you do or have a particular passion. And that's how that love generally manifests itself. You know, I teach in uh, a graduate program where students receive their MFAs in interdisciplinary arts. And 
there, part of the pedagogy is to really get students, these artists, to talk about their work, to reference it, to make citations to it. But you know, I've been moving further and further away from that because it's sometimes really hard to explain why you do this work. You do this work out of this love and out of this passion. And uh, this is really hard to quantify, although many people are beginning to do that with developing happiness quotients in some way. And you really do that. Uh, and many of you all are here because you're using and mastering that for change. Because you are here, and I implore you all to change the world. That's one of the things I tell my students at Goddard. I mean, you are all here to change the world. Uh, if we can do anything, it's for you all to go out and make your own transformations in your families, in your neighborhood, and in the world. And this is what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. And that is this group of folks who are all like-minded, who, who all work because they love each other. And, uh, and are tied together with that love. Now, Martin Luther King also called, uh, Martin Luther King also equated service to greatness. And he felt that the greater you, that the more service you perform, the greater you are. And so what I want to do is to really encourage you all to that greatness and that service in different ways. And that's where I want to end on this, uh, on this note here. This was from our first orchard that we planted, and this was the first uh, pear tree. We planted an orchard just with four pear trees in it of different varieties, and this was the first pear that we were able to harvest from that. So from this little seed uh, that we planted, uh, we were able to begin to harvest it, and hopefully it will harvest itself. Hopefully we'll begin to harvest more and more love as we create not just a livable community, but a lovable one as well. So thank you. Well, great. Any comments, questions, criticisms? Nothing. I answered everything. They're absorbing. It's certainly not a criticism. I really enjoyed that. But, um, uh, tell us a little bit about Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I really can't talk with a, a great detail uh, about Monsanto. One of the things that you all should be aware of, right now before the Supreme Court, there's a farmer from Indiana who is suing, uh, who actually, Monsanto sued him for using uh, their Seeds. Now, if you can imagine this, and many of y'all already know this story, uh, that Monsanto, over the last uh, almost 20 years now, Monsanto has been selling these, uh, selling this seed that has a terminator gene in it, that you can't harvest a plant uh, from it. I mean, it won't really produce a seed that is fertile. I mean, that's one small part of it, but they also produce this plant, and this is really what this lawsuit is about. They produce a plant that uh, is resistant to one of the most widely used herbicides in the, in the U.S. in industrialized agriculture, and that's uh, Roundup. Uh, I don't know, you've probably even seen Roundup commercials on TV. You go into like uh, Menards or uh, uh, Home Depot and Roundup is there. Roundup is a really effective weed killer. It kills everything, every green thing it encounters. And um, 
But Monsanto now has developed a group of plants, uh, corn and soybean, that is resistant to this herbicide. So farmers can spray this herbicide on this plant to kill all the weeds around their corn and soybean, but it won't kill their corn and soybean. Now, Monsanto also patented the seed and that genome so that it literally owns the rights to that seed. And so you can't use their seed without their permission. You have to buy their seed every year. You can't do, you can't do what farmers used to do by saving those seeds and planting them in your field. And so this guy in uh, Indiana, this small farmer, has been using those uh, using those plants uh, that are resistant to the resistance around them, he had and, and really uh, embracing that technology until he wanted to plant uh, a second season of I think it was corn or maybe it was soybean or maybe a mix uh, in an area that really wasn't productive, and so what he did is. Uh, gathered some seed that were seeds that people generally don't use uh, and planted them. Was telling another farmer, and this is like with Monsanto, how uh, this is how intricate this web is and how complicit we all are in this in a way. Uh, was telling some other farmers about it who told Monsanto, and Monsanto came back with his suit. And this suit now has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And we will know in just a little bit uh, how they rule, whether or not a farmer, all of us, have a right to plant whatever seed we want, or whether or not Monsanto really will end up holding this right to the, this patented gene. Uh, I mean, I, that's part of it. Well, if, if, if I could just follow up with a, another leading question, because the so so much of you know your your ending that's that's all about personal empowerment so much of this is also about issues of scale absolutely and it's why i asked about monsanto because yeah. I, I i very much believe in what you're doing in terms of neighborhood but I'd, I'd like you to talk about kind of scale and really in the kind of david and goliath term oh yeah i mean you know really... i really uh, while i'm an urban agriculture advocate, I don't make claims that urban agriculture will feed a city. Uh, even if you raised all of the structures here in Milwaukee and turned all of Milwaukee into a farm and placed all of its residents outside of it, you probably wouldn't be able to feed folks. So, uh, the food system has to be something that has this blend. Uh, now, I advocate uh, urban ag for those reasons of empowerment and uh, to help decrease some of the food costs and, they, and to place, when I say empower folks, uh, I'm talking about people uh, being able to make these interventions in the food system. Uh, but we need a food system that is able to uh, to serve us in uh, we need a food system that's really able to feed us and that is one that is a really integrated food system so like I don't think that you can even do that completely from uh, organics now I, uh, and I said I had just finished this, uh, this project with the Minnesota Institute of Sustainable Agriculture. And there, uh, at the University of Minnesota, in this, one of the oldest buildings on the St. Paul campus, or the farm campus, and directly across the street is the Cargill building. Uh, another uh, big name in uh, industrial ag, or corporate ag, that is, uh, 
big and shiny and new. And on this faculty, uh, the agriculture and natural resource sciences faculty at the University of Minnesota, there are about 250 folks. And I'm sure this is the same way here. Uh, but only about five folks that are focusing on sustainable organic agriculture. Uh, because most of the funding uh, ends up coming by way of big agribusiness as well that, that helps support that. Uh, so I think that we're going to really need a, a truly integrated uh, uh, food system. I mean, if that's where you're going, I'm not yeah, quite that's, sure. No, that's great. I just wanted yeah. to hear what you had to say. Yeah, uh, thank you. yeah, thank you. Anything else? If people have an interest in getting more involved in community <coughs> and projects, how would you suggest people? Oh, I'd say, like, you know, talk to Raul down here about getting involved with Walnut Way. Uh, I know that Growing Power always accepts interns. And then there are a couple other uh, uh, urban agricultural initiatives that are here. But I mean, that's just one point of intersection in, in social change and changing the world. I mean, there are all kind of other ways that I'm sure, uh, and I'm not sure you know, how much service learning is done here or if there's uh, um, or if there is some department or organization here that matches up students with work. Uh, yeah, well, good, good. Well, then that's where I would say to begin and start. Or maybe even to start right here on campus, just by asking, like, what happens to the food waste here? By asking, where does a lot of the food that comes in here, where does it come from? Um, yeah, there you go. Okay. Raul's got the hookup. Yeah. I, I, I can say oh. quickly, though, because he asked about service learning. There is a service learning department here. Pro, uh, it, it was formerly tied to cultures and communities, and now it's in the union, tied to the Center for Volunteerism. And, and, and they are working together now in a new way. So that's a good office to start in. Also, the, the chancellor, water and food are two of the things that the five Yeah, I mean, interrogate the campus. Uh, so, so could you uh, tie it back to art? Uh, because this class, students read this week, uh, Betsy Damon, Fritz Haig. Later on in the semester, students are going to read about Rick Lowe and read an interview with him. So these talks about um, the, the art somewhat is always present, but it disappears at times. Yeah. The artist yeah. as farmer, uh, community organizer, scientist, those those boundaries are blurring all the time. Oh, absolutely. And perhaps for absolutely. some of the students who are new yeah. to art or some of the students who are art, some come back and say, but I don't see the art. Where's the art? Yeah. Could, you, could you define it for yourself? Because you, you, yeah, you embody mean, that. The fact. names that you mentioned are folks who are all friends. Fritz Hayek is going to be at Walker Art Center this Saturday, even, uh -huh. trying to pull together a group of folks to talk about. Uh, uh, a project that he's working on in Minneapolis. And he's been one of the leaders in creating these edible landscapes. Um, but uh, one good source, and I actually have the magazine with me back, at, uh, back in our room, but Public Art Review is the journal, the key journal for, for folks that create public art or administer public art projects in some way. And they produce two issues a year. Uh, the issue from uh, the time before this last one, from spring of last year, was on food. Food is art. And had a number of uh, just documented a number of ways that Artists will integrate food, uh, and and Betsy is uh, an old friend of ours as well too. We used to live in uh, the same artist co-op in St. Paul. Um, 
But beyond all of that, and Rick Lowe. Rick Lowe was a, a good friend, too. Rick and I were, uh, had shared this fellowship uh, at Harvard, the Graduate School of Design, at the same time. You know, and that was even before I went down to Project Row House. Rick Lowe was uh, one of the founders, one of those artists, those African-American artists, that saved those houses from demolition. Um, but kind of in answer to your question, uh, you know, this is, art for me is just one of the tools that I use in transformation. Uh, you can come at this in different ways and from different points. And you should always think about this as this collaboration. Uh, now, many times, you know, working with a group of folks, it ends up being more of a kind of a collaboration than a collaboration, but you have to go through those experiences to be able to get to that point. But it means sharing resources, sharing ideas, uh, sharing uh, projects, but sharing your skill space to think about ways that you can make these personal transformations and also tr that can lead to transforming the world. And so, uh, I approach this as an, uh, as an artist. I approach this work as an artist, but I also approach it as an uh, agriculturalist. I also approach this work as an engaged citizen. Uh, I also approach this work as a husband, a father, uh, a son, and all of those things. And we are all of those things. Uh, and we need to embrace that. It's not that we take off this hat and then put on this hat. It's that all of that is happening under the same head or on the same head. And, uh, and so you really need to cross disciplines and think about ways of crossing disciplines. I mean, you know, prepare yourself. This old timer story coming up. But when I was your age, <laughs> there was no such thing as multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. That's one advantage that we have right now. And when you, especially when you have engaged faculty from different disciplines that are working together uh, because they share an interest. We all should kind of take advantage of that uh, and, uh, and you know, bring to bear all of our skills and all of our capacity. Uh, you know, it was really started out just kind of blending these things together. And really where it came from is uh, my wife and I lived in a renovated storefront, a building that was built in 1901 as a cigar factory. So we live upstairs and have studio space downstairs. So I have these windows that I can open up uh, and let all this light in. And, you know, about 15 years ago, I would see a parade of people walking in one direction past my studio windows and coming back just a few minutes later with bags of groceries, knowing that they had shopped at the Speedy Mart just a block <coughs> away. And, um, and people just didn't have a lot of options. You know, I was fortunate that you know, either on my bike or in a car, we could leave our neighborhood. Uh, and make these really conscious food choices. You know, so that's what really led me into wanting to develop in, uh, community gardens. And uh, I went through the Master Gardener core course that was sponsored through University Extension and to learn more. And then I started even taking classes in horticulture uh, that all kind of led to this graduate degree over a point in time in uh, environmental history. But it really came from wanting to do something, wanting to help give people more food choices, and just watching people walk by my studio window. This kind of piggybacks on what she was saying, but uh, could you describe your first garden? <laughs> My first garden was a disaster. <laughs> I, I'm sure you're going to hear that story. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all get it right the first time. But I, 
planted my first garden uh, in the first house I owned uh, in the 70s. And it was under a black walnut tree. Now, I had no idea. Some of you all laugh because you know what a black walnut tree does. <laughs> but black walnut trees, as a way of defending themselves, literally send a chemical out under throughout its root system to prevent uh, any other plants from growing underneath it. <laughs> I didn't know that <laughs> at the time. And I just kept like uh, trying to figure out why are my plants dying? <laughs> and so, I mean, that was uh, a, a big part of it. But like, and I laugh now because my wife and I garden today. And we, there, my wife is a master gardener, uh, and with all, we've got all these books on gardening, we've got access to everything online with gardening, but we still mess up all the time. I mean, there are these things that we grow, things we try, things that uh, just don't work out right. So we're learning constantly uh, you know, about this, in this grand experiment. Uh, as we try and develop this body of knowledge. Um, I'm going to just try a short anecdote with follow up a quick question, uh -huh. and, and maybe we'll see what happens. I, you know, I'm going to say to it an Imagining America conference. It's a, it's a conference where uh, people get together to talk about community engagement and higher education. And, um, and so, as soon as I saw his presentation, I said, I'm going to see how you get him to come to Milwaukee. And uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you have been to Minneapolis, St. Paul, but one of the stunning things in the summer is that in the front of those, uh, uh, in the front of properties, on the part that's not private property, but rather city property, I'm, I'm thinking, I know that's the way it'd be in Milwaukee, uh, there are flowers planted <laughs> around trees. And uh, it's, it's stunningly beautiful. And I, I remember I was, I was with a friend in Minneapolis, and I was saying, you know, I really, I really like these, this, that, right, just briefly, man. I said, I really like these, these flowers and these, you know. But I'm, I'm wondering if we can get away with that. And oh, she said, that's St. Two. I said, St. Two Jones. <laughs> she said, yeah, St. Two Jones. He's part of that initiative. And uh, so, but I was thinking about that. Um, and as I, as I look at your work, the sort of, uh, broad spectrum of some things where you have seed bombs that are, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're doing things you're not asking permission to do. Exactly. Or uh, are even illegal and something yeah. like that. And then if you're also doing the sanctioned uh, public art. And you're always uh, navigating spaces where you're kind of biting the hand that feeds you. Absolutely. And that's I always an issue. Speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's always uh, uh, an issue. I mean, right now, or tomorrow, uh, there's a group of folks that we've been working with that, are, and I, I should tell you a little bit, just real briefly, we have been working to transform this 12-acre site in Frogtown that was the former campus to a local foundation. They moved off the site, uh, leaving it there, uh, and this is also in a neighborhood that has the least amount of green space. Uh, for, uh, for children, devoted to children. And so we really have been working to transform this into a park and, uh, and farm. So about five acres of this site would be uh, devoted to this farm. Anyway, uh, we have hooked up with a good partner, a great partner, Trust for Public Land that throughout the country, and there are offices here, there's an office here in Milwaukee, that is really set up to preserve open space. This was a perfect opportunity for them to, uh, to work with a, a local group that was really just a few miles away from their offices to preserve this. And so they have really, now they are some of the best fundraisers that I've ever encountered. Uh, we launched, uh, not even a year ago, a $3 million campaign to acquire the land and then begin to do some of the program and some of the improvements to this land. Believe it or not, we've got almost all of those commitments made. Now, 
that money has come from a wide range of places. About a million dollars came from the city of St. Paul, and about a million and a half came from the state of Minnesota. But the rest of it has come from private individuals and from private foundations and corporations. Um, our neighborhood has really been devastated by the current foreclosure crisis. One of the contributors that we just found out <laughs> to Trust for Public Land appeal to was Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has been public enemy number one in our neighborhood. Uh, so they donated $75,000 to this, uh, to this effort. And it's nothing compared to the value of the properties uh, or the the value, the overall value of property in Frogtown that has been devalued by uh, the properties that they sit on or have foreclosed on. And we've really lost people as a result of that. The population just a few years ago, before the housing crisis, was uh, 17,000. We've lost 2,000 people. So the neighborhood literally is quieter. And we talk about that all the time. Uh, but it's because of the fact that you know, this crisis has hit us. And so, yeah, here we still, uh, we are still going to take action against Wells Fargo. Uh, and, and I mean, the really irony of this thing is the money came from Wells Fargo's national office. And not from the local folks at all, but the local folks got wind of it. And they want to uh, do this big ceremony so where they hand over the great big check uh, to show how friendly they are. Well, none of us are going. <laughs> so, so they have been trying to recruit folks uh, that would accept that check. Uh, our city council person, I think, is going to accept the check. Uh, but yeah, so there are, and, and there are all these other things. I mean, there is no money that does not that is not tainted with blood in some way, uh, and that's something we all have to wrestle with. I mean, we live in this really complex and layered world where we make these decisions all the time. I was talking to somebody, one of the students today. I was talking to Brooklyn. And she was saying, and I, I've done this as well. I mean, there are pieces that I've done that I uh, won't claim now, you know, because I was in a different space. Uh, but, you know, that story there is really just to relate how complex uh, these decisions are and how we're going, how you are always going to deal with uh, making those decisions in some way. So, yeah, prepare yourself. Anything else? One more. I don't completely understand your um, your water fountain piece. You described it more. You said endangered mussel. Yeah. What's that all about? Oh well, yeah. When I said I should have said, how many guys? When I say mussel, I'm talking about a clam. It's like a, uh, there are the Mississippi River uh, as it flows from its headwaters. You know, all the way down to where it enters the Gulf of Mexico, at one time was loaded with these mussels. There were some places where European explorers encountered villages uh, by the indigenous people here, that where there were mounds of these mussel shells. And there are some places along the river where they still grow and thrive. But they were the basis of the ecological system uh, of the Mississippi River. I mean, the, part, of the riv part of the reason the river was kept clean was by the, the filtering action that these mussels provide. And these mussels now have decreased in number uh, through pollution, through uh, the way the river has been engineered for traffic, uh, for river traffic, barge traffic primarily. Uh, and so this was a way that I could at least draw attention to that or make some homage to uh, 
the, these endangered mussels. And there are several, uh, uh, several varieties of mussels that have either become extinct or that are very rare or endangered. That makes sense? It sure does. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all again. All right. So, uh, my class, feel free, or everyone, to talk to the artists next 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so, and we'll resume at about 10 to 9.